Oops. Okay. Chapter eight. Here we go. I can see I never should have left you alone, Phineas went on before I could recover from the impact of finding him there. Where did you get those clothes? His bright, indignant eyes swept from my battered gray cap down the frayed sweater and painted stained pants to a pair of clod hoppers. You don't have to advertise like that. We all know you're the worst dressed man in the class. I've been working, that's all. These are just work clothes. In the boiler room? On the railroad, shoveling snow. He sat back in the chair. Shoveling railroad snow, well, that makes sense. We always did that the first term. I pulled off the sweater under which I was wearing a rain slicker I used to go sailing in, a kind of canvas sack. Phineas just studied it in wordless absorption. I like the cut of it, he finally muttered, murmured. I pulled off that revealing an army fatigue shirt my brother had given me. Very topical, said Phineas through his teeth. After that came off, there was just my undershirt stained with sweat. He smiled at it for a while and then said, as he heaved himself out of the chair, there. You should have worn that all day, just that. That has real taste. The rest of your outfit was just gilding that lily of a sweatshirt. Glad to hear you like it. Not at all, he replied ambiguously, reaching for a pair of crutches which leaned against the desk. I took the sight of this all right. I had seen him on crutches the year before when he broke his ankle playing football. At Devon, crutches had almost as many athletic associations as shoulder pads, and I had never seen an invalid whose skin glowed with such health, accenting the sharp clarity of his eyes or one who used his arms and shoulders on crutches as though on parallel bars, as though he would do a somersault on them if he felt like it. Phineas vaulted across the room to his cot, yanked back the spread and then groaned. Ah, Christ, it's not made up. What is all this crap about no maids? No maids, I said. After all, there's a war on. It's not much of a sacrifice when you think of people starving and being bombed and all the other things. My unselfishness was responding properly in, to the influences of 1942. In these past months, Phineas and I had grown apart on this. I felt a certain disapproval of him for grumbling about a lost luxury with a war on. After all, I repeated, there is a war on. Is there? He murmured absently. I didn't pay any attention. He was always speaking when his thoughts were somewhere else, asking rhetorical questions and echoing other people's words. I found some sheets and made up his bed for him. He wasn't a bit sensitive about being helped, not a bit like an invalid striving to seem independent. I put this on the list of things to include when I said some prayers, the first in a long time that night in bed. Now that Phineas was back, it seemed time to start saying prayers again. After the lights went out, the special quality of my silence let him know that I was saying them, and he kept quiet for approximately three minutes. Then he began to talk. He never went to sleep without talking first, and he seemed to feel that prayers lasting more than three minutes were showing off. God was always unoccupied in Finney's universe, ready to lend an ear at any time at all. Anyone who failed to get his message through in three minutes, as I sometimes failed to do when trying to impress him, Phineas, with my sanctity, wasn't trying. He was still talking when I fell asleep, and the next morning, through the icy atmosphere which one window raised an inch had admitted to our room, he woke me with the over-indignant shout, what is all this crap about no maids? He was sitting up in bed as though ready to spring out of it, totally and energetically awake. I had to laugh at this indignant athlete with the strength of five people complaining about the service. He threw back his bedclothes and said, hand me my crutches, will you? Until now, in spite of everything, I had welcomed each new day as though it were a new life, where all past failures and problems were erased and all future possibilities and joys open and available to be achieved probably before night fell again. Now, in this winter of snow and crutches with Phineas, I began to know that each morning reassured the problems of the night before, that sleep suspended all but changed nothing, that you couldn't make yourself over between dawn and dusk. Phineas, however, did not believe this. I'm sure that he looked down at his leg every morning first thing, as soon as he remembered it, to see if it had not been totally restored while he slept. When he found on his, this first morning back at Devon that it happened to still be crippled and in a cast, he said in his usual self-contained way, hand me my crutches, will you? Brinker Hadley next door always awoke like an express train. There was a gathering rumble through the wall as Brinker reared up in bed, coughed hoarsely, slammed his feet on the floor, pounded through the freezing air to the closet for something in the way of clothes and thundered down the hall to the bathroom. Today, however, he veered and broke up into our room instead. Ready to sign up? He shouted before he was through the door. You ready to end? Finny, you ready to end what? pursued Finney from his bed. Who's ready to sign an N what? Finney, by God, you're back. Sure, confirmed Finney with a slight pleased grin. So, Brinker curled his lip at me. 
Your little plot didn't work so well after all. What's he talking about? Said Finney as I thrust his crutches beneath his shoulders. Just talking, I said shortly. What does Brinker ever talk about? You know what I'm talking about well enough. No, I don't. Oh, yes, you do. Are you telling me what I know? Damn right I am. What's he talking about, said Finney. The room was bitterly cold. I stood trembling in front of Phineas, still holding his crutches in place, unable to turn and face Brinker and this joke he had gotten into his head, this catastrophic joke. He wants to know if I'll sign up with him, I said. Enlist. It was the ultimate question for all 17-year-olds that year, and it drove Brinker's insinuations from every mind but mine. Yeah, said Brinker. Enlist, cried Finney at the same time. His large and clear eyes turned with an odd expression on me. I had never seen such a look in them before. After looking at me closely, he said, you're going to enlist? Well, I just thought, last night after the railroad work, you thought you might sign up, he went on, looking carefully away. Brinker drew one of his deep senatorial breaths, but he found nothing to say. We three stood shivering in the thin New Hampshire morning light, Finney and I in pajamas, Brinker in a blue flannel bathrobe and ripped moccasins. When will you? Finney went on. Oh, I don't know, I said. It was just something Brinker happened to say last night, that's all. I said, Brinker began in an unusually guarded voice, glancing quickly at Phineas. I said something about enlisting today. Finney hobbled over to the dresser and took up his soap dish. I'm first in the shower, he said. You can't get that cast wet, can you? asked Brinker. No, I'll just, I'll keep it outside the curtain. I'll help, said Brinker. No, said Finney, without looking at him. I can manage all right. How can you manage all right? Brinker insisted aggressive, persisted aggressively. I can manage all right. Finney repeated with a set face. I could hardly believe it, but it was too plainly printed in the closed expression of his face to mistake, too discernible beneath the even tone of his voice. Phineas was shocked at the idea of my leaving. In some way, he needed me. He needed me. I was the least trustworthy person he had ever met. I knew that. He knew or should know that too. I had even told him. I had told him. But there was no mistaking the shield of remoteness in his face and voice. He wanted me around. The war then passed away from me and dreams of enlistment and escape and a clean start lost their meaning for me. Sure, you can manage the shower all right, I said, but what difference does it make? Come on, Brinker's always, Brinker's always getting there first. Enlist, what a nutty idea. It's just Brinker wanting to get there first again. I wouldn't enlist with you if you were General MacArthur's eldest son. Brinker reared back arrogantly. And who do you think I am? But Finney had heard that. His face had broken into a wide and dazzled smile at what I had said, lighting up his whole face. Enlist, I drove on. I wouldn't enlist with you if you were Elliot Roosevelt, first cousin, said Brinker under his chin, once removed. He wouldn't enlist with you, Finney plunged in, if you were Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Well, I qualified in an, un an undertone. He really is Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Well, fan my brow, said Finney. Giving, giving his, his stunned look of total appalled, horrified amazement. Who would have thought that? Chinese, the yellow peril right here at Devon. And as far as the history of the class of 1943 at the Devon School is concerned, this was the only part of our conversation worth preserving. Brinker Hadley had been tagged with the nickname at last. After four years of creating them for others and eluding one himself, Yellow Peril Hadley swept through the school with the speed of flu epidemic, and it must be said to his credit that Brinker took it well enough, except when, in its inevitable abbreviations, people sometimes called him Yellow instead of Peril. But in a week, I had forgotten that, and I have never since forgotten the dazed look on Finney's face when he thought that on the day of his return to Devon, I was going to desert him. I didn't know why he had chosen me, why it was only to me that he could show them the most humbling sides of his handicap. I didn't care. For the war was no longer eroding the peaceful summertime stillness I had prized so much at Devon. And although the playing fields were crusted under a foot of congealed snow and the river was now a hard gray white lane of ice between gaunt trees, peace had come back to Devon for me. So the war swept over like a wave at the seashore, gathering power and size as it bore on us, overwhelming in its rush, seemingly inescapable. And then at the last moment, eluded by a word from Phineas, I had simply ducked. That was all and the wave's concentrated power had hurtled harmlessly overhead, no doubt throwing others roughly up on the beach, but leaving me peaceably treading water as before. I did not stop to think that one wave is inevitably followed by another, even larger and more powerful when the tide is coming in. I like the winter, Finney reassured me for the fourth time as we came back from chapel that morning. Well, it doesn't like you. 
Wooden plank walks had been placed on many of the school paths for better footing, but there were icy patches everywhere on them. A crutch misplaced and he could be thrown down upon the frozen wooden planking or into the ice encrusted snow. Even indoors, Devon was a nest of traps for him. The school had been largely rebuilt with a massive bequest from an oil family some years before in a peculiar style of Puritan grandeur, as though Versailles had been modified for the needs of the Sunday school. This opulent sobriety betrayed the divided nature of the school, just as in a different way, the two rivers that it straddled did. From the outside, the buildings were reticent, severe straight lines of red brick or white clapboard with shutters standing sentinel beside each window and a few unassuming white cupolas placed here and there on the roofs because they were expected and not pretty like pilgrim bonnets. But once you pass through the colonial doorways with only an occasional fan window or low relief pillar to suggest that a certain muted adornment was permissible, you entered an extravaganza of pompadour splendor. Pink marble walls and white marble floors were enclosed by arched and vaulted ceilings. An assembly room had been done in the manner of the high Italian Renaissance. Another was illuminated by chandeliers flashing with crystal teardrops. There was a wall of fragile French windows overlooking an Italian garden of marble bric-a-brac. The library was provincial on the first floor, Rococo on the second, and everywhere, except in the dormitories, the floors and stairs were of smooth, slick marble, more treacherous even than the icy walks. The winter loves me, he retorted, and then, disliking the whimsical sound of that, added, I mean, as much as you can say a season can love. What I mean is, I love winter, and when you really love something, then it loves you back in whatever way it has to love. I didn't think that this was true. My 17 years of experience had shown this to be much more false than true but it was like every other thought and belief of Finney's. It should have been true, so I didn't argue. The boardwalk ended and he moved a little ahead of me as we descended a sloping path toward our first class. He picked his way with surprising care, surprising in anyone who before had used the ground mainly as a point of departure, as the given element in the suspended world of leaps in space. And now I remembered what I had never taken any special note of before, how Phineas used to walk. Around Devon, we had gates of every description, gangling shuffles from boys who had suddenly grown a foot taller, swinging cowboy lobes from those thinking of how wide their shoulders had become, ambles, waddles, light trippings, gigantic bunion strides. But Phineas had moved in continuous flowing balance so that he had seemed to drift along with no effort at all. Relaxation on the move. He hobbled now among the patches of ice. There was the one certainty that Dr. Sandpole had given. Phineas would walk again. But the thought was there before me that he would never walk like that again. Do you have a class? He said as we reached the steps of the building. Yes. So do I. Let's not go. Not go, but what do we use for an excuse? We'll say I fainted from exertion on the way from chapel. He looked at me with a phantom smile. And you had to tend me. This is your first day back, Finn. You're no one to cut classes. I know, I know. I'm going to work. I really am going to work. You're going to pull me through mostly, but I am going to work as hard as I can. Not only not today, not the first thing, not now, not conjugating verbs when I haven't even looked at school yet. I want to see this place. I haven't seen anything except the inside of our room and the inside of a chapel. I don't feel like seeing the inside of a classroom. Not now, not yet. What do you want to see? He had started to turn around so that his back was to me. Let's go to the gym, he said shortly. The gym was at the other end of the school, a quarter of a mile away at least, separated from us by a field of ice. We set off without saying anything else. By the time we had reached it, sweat was running like oil from Finney's face, and when we, he paused, involuntary tremors shook his hands and arms. The leg in its cast was like a sea anchor dragged behind. The illusion of strength I had seen in our room that morning must have been the same illusion he had used at home to deceive his doctor and his family into sending him back to Devon. We stood, once, we stood on the ice-coated lawn in front of the gym while he got ready to enter it, resting himself so that he could go in with a show of energy. Later, this became his habit. I often caught up with him standing in front of a building, pretending to be thinking or examining the sky or taking off gloves, but it was never a convincing show. Phineas was a poor deceiver, having had no practice. We went into the gym along a marble step hallway, and to my surprise, we went on past the trophy room where his name was already inscribed on one cup, one banner, and one embalmed football. I was sure that this was his goal, to mull over his lost glories. I had prepared myself for that and even thought of several positive uplifting aphorisms to cheer him up. But, but he went by it without a thought, down a stairway, deep, steep in marble, and into the locker room. I went along mystified behind him, beside him. 
There was a pile of dirty towels in a corner. Finney shoved them with a crutch. What is all this crap? He muttered with a little smile about no maids. The locker room was empty at this hour, row after row of dull green lockers separated by wooden, wide wooden benches. The ceiling was hung, was hung with pipes. It was a drab room for Devon, dull green and brown and gray, but at the far end, there was a big marble archway, glisteningly white, which led to the pool. Finney sat down on a bench, struggled out of his sheep-lined winter coat, and took a deep breath of gymnasium air. No locker room could have more pungent air than Devon's. Sweat predominated, but it was richly mingled with smells of paraffin and singed rubber, of soaked wool and liniment, and for those who could interpret it, of exhaustion, lost hope and triumph and bodies battling against each other. I thought it anything but a bad smell. It was preeminently the smell of the human body after it had been used to the limit, such a smell as has meaning and poignance for any athlete, just as it has for any lover. Phineas looked down here and there at the exercise bar over a sand pit next to the wall at a set of weights on the floor, at the rolled up wrestling mat, at a pair of spiked shoes kicked under a locker. Same old place, isn't it? He said, turning to me and nodding slightly. After a moment, I answered in a quiet voice. Not exactly. He made no pretense of not understanding me. After a pause, he said, you're going to be the big star now, in an optimistic tone, and then added with some embarrassment, you can fill any gaps or anything. He slapped me on the, ba on the back. Get over there and chin yourself a few dozen times. What'd you finally go out for anyway? I finally didn't go out. You aren't. His eyes burned at me from his grimacing face. Still the assistant senior crew manager. No, I quit that. I've just been going to gym classes, the ones they have for guys who aren't going out for anything. He wrenched himself around on the bench. Joking was passed. His mouth widened irritably. What in hell? His voice bounded on the word in a sudden rich descent. Did you do that for? It was too late to sign up for anything else, and seeing the energy to blast this excuse rushing to his face and neck, I stumbled on. And anyway, with the war on, there won't be many trips for the teams. I don't know, sports seem, don't seem so important with the war on. Have you swallowed all that war stuff? No, of course I, I was so committed to refuting him that I had, had half denied the charge before I understood it. Now my eyes swung back to his face. All what war stuff? All that stuff about there being a war. I don't think I get what you mean. Do you really think that the United States of America is in a state of war with Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan? Do I really think? My voice trailed off. He stood up, his weight on the good leg and the other resting lightly on the floor in front of him. Don't be a sap, he gazed with cool self-possession at me. There isn't any war. I know why you're talking like this, I said, struggling to keep up with him. Now I understand. You're still under the influence of some medicinal drug. No, you are. Everybody is. He pivoted so that he was facing directly at me. That's what this whole war story is, a medicinal drug. Listen, did you ever hear of the Roaring Twenties? I nodded very slowly and cautiously. When they all drank bathtub gin and everybody was young, but everybody who was young did just what they wanted? Yes. Well, what happened was that they didn't like that the preachers and the old ladies and the stuffed shirts. So then they tried prohibition and everybody just got drunker. So then they really got desperate and arranged the depression. That kept the people who were young in the thirties in their places, but they couldn't use that trick forever. So for us in the forties, they cooked up this war fake. Who are they anyway? The fat old men who don't want us crowding them out of their jobs. They've made it all up. There isn't any real food shortage, for instance. The men have all the best steaks delivered to their clubs now. You've noticed how they've been getting fatter lately, haven't you? His tone took it thoroughly for granted that I had. For a moment, I was almost taken in by it. Then my eyes fell on the bound and, and cast white mass pointing at me. And as it was always to do, it brought me down out of Finney's world of invention, down again as I had fallen after awakening that morning, down to reality, to the facts. Phineas, this is all pretty amusing and everything, but I hope you don't play this game too much with yourself. You might start to believe it, and then I'd have to make a reservation for you at the funny farm. In a way, deep in argument, his eyes never wavered from mine. The whole world is on a funny farm now, but it's only the fat old men who get the joke. And you. Yes, and me. What makes you so special? Why should you get it and all the rest of us be in the dark? The momentum of the argument abrupt, abruptly broke from his control. His face froze. Because I've suffered, he burst out. 
We drew back in amazement from this. In the silence, all the flighty spirits of the morning ended between us. He sat down and turned his flushed face away from me. I sat next to him without moving for as long as my beating nerves would permit. And then I stood up and walked slowly toward anything which presented itself. It turned out to be the exercise bar. I sprang up, grabbed it, and then in a fumbling and perhaps grotesque offering to Phineas, I'd shinned myself. I couldn't think of anything else, not the right words, not the right gesture. I did what I could think of. Do 30 of them, he mumbled in a bored voice. I had never done 10 of them. At the 12th, I discovered that he had been counting to himself because he began to count aloud in a non-committal half-heard voice. At 18, there was a certain enlargement in his tone. And at 23, the last edges of boredom left it. He stood up and the urgency with which he brought out the next numbers was like an invisible boost lifting me the distance of my arms until he sang out 30 with a flare of pleasure. The moment was past. Phineas, I know, had been even more startled than I to discover this bitterness in himself. Neither of us ever mentioned it again, and neither of us ever forgot that it was there. He sat down and studied his clenched hands. Did I ever tell you, he began in a husky tone, that I used to be aiming for the Olympics? He wouldn't have mentioned it, except that after what he had said, he had to say something very personal, something deeply held. To do otherwise, to begin joking, would have been a hypocritical denial of what had happened, and Phineas was not capable of that. I was still hanging from the bar. My hands felt as though they had sunk into it. No, you never told me that, I mumbled into my arm. Well, I was, and now I'm not sure, not 100% sure I'll be completely, you know, in shape by 1944, so I'm going to coach you for them instead. But there isn't going to be any Olympics in 44. That's only a couple of years away. The war... Leave your fantasy life out of this. We're grooming, grooming you for the Olympics, pal, in 1944. And not believing him, not forgetting that troops were being shuttled toward battlefields all over the world, I went along, as I always did, with any new invention of fittings. There was no harm in taking aim, even if the target was a dream. But since we were so far out of the line of fire, the chief sustenance for any sense of the war was mental. We saw nothing real of it. All our impressions of the war were in the false medium of two dimensions, photographs in the papers and, ma and magazines, newsreels, posters, or artificially conveyed to us by a voice on the radio or headlines across the top of the newspaper. I found that only through a continuous use of the imagination could I hold out against Finney's driving offensive in favor of peace. And now when we were served chicken livers for dinner, I couldn't help conceiving a mental picture of President Roosevelt and my father and Finney's father and numbers of other large old men sitting down to porterhouse steak in some elaborate but secluded men's secret society room. When a letter from home told me that a trip to visit relatives had been canceled because of gas rationing, it was easy to visualize my father smiling silently with knowing eyes, at least as easy as it was to imagine an American horse crawling through the jungles of a place called Guadalcanal, wherever that is, as Phineas said. And when in chapel day after day, we were exhorted to new levels of self-deprivation and hard work, with the war as their justification, it was impossible not to see that the faculty were using this excuse to drive us as they had always wanted to drive us, regardless of any war or peace. What a joke if Finney was right after all. But of course I didn't believe him. I was too well protected against the great fear of boys' school life, which is to be taken in. Along with everyone else except a few professional gulls such as Leper, I rejected anything which had the smallest possibility of doubt about it. So of course I didn't believe him. But one day, after our chaplain, Mr. Carhart, had become very moved by his own sermon in chapel about God in the foxhole, I came away thinking that if Finney's opinion of the war was unreal, Mr. Carhart's was at least as unreal. But of course I didn't believe him. And anyway, I was too occupied to think about it all. In addition to my own work, I was dividing my time between tutoring Finney in studies and being tutored by him in sports. Since so much of learning dep anything depends on the atmosphere in which it is taught, Finney and I, to our joint double amazement, began to make flashing progress where we had been bumblers before. Mornings, we got up at six to run. I dressed in a gym sweatsuit with a towel tucked around my throat and Finney in pajamas, ski boots, and a sheep-lined coat. A morning shortly before Christmas vacation brought my reward. I was to run the course Finney had laid out four times around an oval walk, which circled the headmaster's home, a large, rambling, doubtfully colonial white mansion. Next to the house, there was a a patriarchal elm tree against the trunk of which Finney leaned and shouted at me as I ran a large circle around him. This plain of snow shone a powdery white that morning. 
The sun blazed icily somewhere too low on the horizon to be seen directly, but its clean rays shed a blue-white glimmer all around us. The northern sunshine seemed to pick up, pick up faint particles of whiteness floating in the air and powdering the sleek blue sky. Nothing stirred. The bare arching branches of the elms seemed laid into this motionless sky. As I ran, the sound of my footfalls was pitched off short in the vast immobile dawn, as though there was no room amid so many glittering sights for any sound to intrude. The figure of Phineas was set against the bulk of the tree. He shouted now and then, but these sounds, too, were quickly absorbed and dispelled. And he needed to give no advice that morning. After making two circuits of the walk, every trace of energy was, as usual, completely used up. And as I drove myself on, all, all, drove myself on, all my scattered aches found their usual way to a profound seat of pain in my side. My lungs were, as usual, were fed up with all this work, and from now on would only go rakingly through the motions. My knees were boneless again, ready at any minute to let my lower legs telescope up into the thighs. My head felt as though different sections of the cranium were grinding into each other. Then, for no reason at all, I felt magnificent. It was as though my body, until that instant, had simply been lazy, as though the aches and exhaustion were all imagination, created from nothing in order to keep me from truly exerting myself. Now, my body seemed to at last say, well, if you must have it, here. And an accession of strength came flooding through me. Buoyed up, I forgot my usual feeling of routine self-pity when working out. I lost myself, oppressed a mind among, along with aching body. All entanglements were shed. I broke into the clear. After the fourth circuit, like sitting in a chair, I pulled up in front of Phineas. You're not even winded, he said. I know. You found your rhythm, didn't you? That third time around, just as you came into that straight part there. Yes, right there. You've been pretty lazy all along, haven't you? Yes, I guess I have been. You didn't even know anything about yourself. I don't guess I did in a way. Well, he gathered the sheepskin collar around his throat. Now you know. And stop talking like a Georgia cracker. Don't guess I did. Despite this jibe, he was rather impersonal toward me. He seemed older that morning and leaning quietly against that tree wrapped in his heavy coat. He seemed smaller too. Or perhaps it was only that I, inside the same body, had felt myself all at once grown bigger. We proceeded slowly back to the dormitory. On the steps going in, we met Mr. Ludbury coming out. I've been watching you from my window, he said in his hooting voice with a rare trace of personal interest. What are you up to, Forrester, training for the commandos? There was no rule explicitly forbidding exercise at such an hour, but it was not expected. Ordinarily, therefore, Mr. Ludsbury would have disapproved. But the war had modified even his standards. All forms of physical exercise had become conventional for the duration. I mumbled some abashed answer, but it was Phineas who made the clear response. He's developing into a real athlete, he said matter-of-factly. We're aiming for the 44 Olympics. Mr. Ludsbury emitted a single chuckle from deep in his throat. Then his face turned brick red momentarily, and he assumed his customary sententiousness. Games are all right in their place, he said, and I won't bore you with the Eaton playing fields observation, but all exercise today is aimed, of course, at the approaching Waterloo. Keep that in your sights at all time, won't you? Finney's face set in determination with the older look I had just detected in him. No, he said. I don't believe any student had ever said no flatly to Mr. Ludsbury before. It flustered him uncontrollably. His face turned brick red again, and for a moment I thought he was going to run away. Then he said something so rapid, throaty, and clipped that neither of us understood it, turned quickly and strode off across the quadrangle. He's really sincere. He thinks there's a war on, said Finney with in simple wonder. Now, why wouldn't he know? He pondered Mr. Ludsbury's exclusion from the plot of the fat old man as we watched his figure, Reedy, even in his winter wraps, move away from us. Then the light broke. Oh, of course, he cried. Too thin, of course. I stood there pitying Mr. Ludsbury for his fatal thinness and reflecting that after all, he had always had a gullible side. 